We're in business to save the planet, and we use making clothes to do that. The cure for depression is action. Every one of us has to step up and do what you can according to what your resources are. That was the voice of Patagonia's Yvonne Chouinard. And this is Type 2, a podcast from Looking Sideways in association with Patagonia that explores the intersection between outdoors, action sports and activism. Now, in each show, I'm meeting people who are using their passion and involvement with the cultures we all love to create change. I've been discussing the issues they're involved with, the change they're seeking to create, the difficulties involved and the rewards that follow. Now, this week's guest is Mario Molina. And what a chat this one is. So Mario is a climber, snowboarder, mountain biker and guide, alpinist, I think you could say who grew up in Guatemala, but today lives in Colorado with his wife and dog. Um, As I discovered, he's also somebody who's dedicated his life to the fight for climate action. Firstly, as deputy director at the Alliance for Climate Education, and then latterly as international director at the Climate Reality Project, where he worked with Al Gore and helped oversee that organization's post-Paris Agreement strategy. Not a bad CV to start with, right? Today, he's Executive Director of Protect Our Winters. Now, I imagine that most regular Type 2 listeners will be familiar with the work of that organisation, thanks to previous episodes of Type 2, notably with Jake Black, or from previous episodes of my Looking Sideways podcast with guests such as Protect Our Winters founder and President Jeremy Jones. So covered the kind of the backstory of the organisation in those episodes. So if you're interested in finding out about that, then, you know, go and listen to those. That isn't what I talked to Mario Mario about for this episode. What we talked about was um, basically their strategy during the busiest and most critical period in the organisation's history and probably the most critical period in the ongoing climate change conversation. Yes, I am talking about the 2020 presidential election, which is looming and which is going to be one of the most important events. Um, I'm going to say this century um, when with regards to the climate conversation and Mario is helping drive Protect Our Winter and sister organisation the Protect Our Winter Action Fund strategy during this critical time and they're using a highly targeted and calculated plan to try and mobilise a potential 50 million outdoor state that's inverted commas voters and drive the narrative in a way that basically depoliticizes the climate conversation and try and move it away from that binary left-right argument which these issues tend to devolve to. Now, they're massive ambitions, and they stem from Protect Our Winter's ultimate aim, which is to achieve systemic change in transportation and energy at the highest possible level. Like I said, I talked to Jeremy about this in that episode, but this is specifically geared around the election at the end of 2020, and it meant that me and Mario had plenty to talk about as we caught up over Zoom in August 2020. Now naturally I was also keen to tap into his depth of experience to see what we can learn from his own unique perspective on the challenges we face when it comes to climate change, particularly in this post, well not even post, in this Covid world that we're experiencing right now. The result is a rich, fascinating and extremely insightful conversation with somebody who's got a hard-earned and unique take on where we are. Um, I found it, to I really enjoyed it. He's a great conversationalist, very generous um, listener as well. So yeah, hope you enjoy it too. Here's me and Mario. I'll be back at the end. Nice one. There we go. How you doing? Yeah, doing well. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. No, pleasure. Nice to meet you. I, I mean, I have a feeling we might have met. Would you have been at ISPO a couple of years ago? No, I wouldn't have been at ISPO, but it's possible that we met when we had our uh, Protect Our Winters European Summit last March. Right when you talked to Jake, I think you might have been flying flying in from the UK to Innsbruck. I think we were having dinner like the last day. We were all pretty beaten. You seemed pretty tired as well. I think. Ah, that was that was what it was. Yeah, it was in Innsbruck. Yeah, no, I remember because I was like, we've definitely met. I had a crazy uh, like, I think I can't remember. But it was a long, long, long day that one. So yeah, I was pretty beat as well. Yeah, and we had just wrapped up about three or four days of strategic planning. So I think we were all a little worn weary. Yeah, everyone looked pretty brain dead, as I as I recall. Yeah. Um. So so where are you now? 
Uh, I'm at home, so I live in Rawlinsville, Colorado, which is a very small town. Literally, I think there's 200 people in the town, 45, 50 minutes west of Boulder, Colorado. So we're right at the base of the continental divide on the Indian Peaks Wilderness. Wow, sounds beautiful. So quite, I'm presuming quite a nice place to be um, for lockdown by the sounds of it. It we feel pretty fortunate. Yeah, we feel pretty fortunate. We're uh, we have pretty easy access to mountain bike trails, not too far from climbing, and lots of good hiking options as well. So yeah, we we feel pretty fortunate, and you know we're at an elevation of 8,800 feet. So yeah, it's also been helpful in terms of getting staying away from the from the summer heat wave. Right. Okay. Brutal. Right. Right. Okay. Nice. Uh, well, I mean, there's a lot to get into in this conversation, I think, um, you know, but there's, there's, you know, it's not an, an original observation to say this is the <laughs> craziest year anyone can remember with COVID and also, you know, the election that you've got forthcoming. And I'm really interested in talking to you about that because I, I, I think I mentioned earlier, I had Jeremy on the, on the podcast, Jeremy Jones, who obviously, you know, really well and work with really closely. I had Jeremy on in January 2018, and at the time, we talked a lot about Tr- we talked a lot about Trump. We had talked a lot at the time about Zinke and about the uh, the changes that were being brought in by the by at the time were a new administration, let's say newish administration, and I think the full repercussions of of that change were being felt. And now, obviously, what have we got to the election? Eighty days around? Oh, less than that. Seventy two days. Seventy one days. Yeah. And, you know, this is being positioned as the most important election of a generation for a variety of reasons. But clearly, from a a climate point of view, it probably is the most important election ever. So how are you guys? What's your approach? How what what, what what's the plan to uh, to have a voice in this forthcoming election? Yeah, well, thanks. Thank you for having us. And thank you for talking about the uh, about the subject. So we believe that the outdoor sports community is one of the most directly impacted communities uh, because of the impact of climate change. And so we're stakeholders, whether we realize it, whether we realize it or not. Our lifestyle and the places that we love are really dependent on us figuring out how we're going to address climate change in a very, very short time span. Uh, there's in the U.S. There's approximately depends on you know who's counting 35 to 50 million people who identify as outdoor enthusiasts, whether it be mountain bikers, trail runners, snowboarders, skiers, climbers, etc. And that if if we all voted with climate as a top priority, we'd represent the largest state in the country in terms of in the U.S. There's a lot of focus on what are called swing states, so Think of Michigan, Wisconsin, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, sometimes people throw in Nevada, maybe Colorado, less so now. And there's a lot of focus on those states because they can go either way. But none of those states have as many people as you know, the community of outdoor sport enthusiasts. So would they be like, so just to contextualize that a little bit, I've got a couple of questions. So how big is the electorate in the States? If you're saying there's 50 million constituency to empower like how how big is the actual voting electorate? It ranges between it ranges from election to election. So when you think about you know you, when you think about the I think it was the twenty the twenty twelve election it was almost fifty sixty million people. Um, and so, but I think more important than the overall electorate. I mean, it, it, it's important, of course, you know, 60 million, 70 million people, 40 to 70 million people, depending on the election, but it's the margins. And when you think about the number of people who actually vote, but when you think about uh, in relation to the people, the votes that actually change the outcome of an election. In the 2016 election, it was determined by 60 to, depending on how you count it, 60 to 80,000 votes in five states. And these are the swing states that you refer to, right? And these are, you know, and these were some of the swing states that you referred to. And then if you break that down even further by precinct, 
you know, with, when you're talking about voting precinct, there were precincts that would swing uh, swung by two, three votes, you know, in a, in a precinct. So the margins are really, really thin. And I think that that's something we just did a, a program with Jesse Diggins and, you know, as, a, as an Olympic gold medalist in, in cross country skiing, she's somebody that really understands the importance of margins because in her sport, you win by fractions of seconds. Uh, and that's that's kind of where, where the political process in the U.S. is at, where it's these really, really small margins that end up making huge differences, whether they be at, at, the, you know, at, the, at the electoral booth or whether they be even in Congress when you have votes like the tax bill that opened up the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge for drilling. That was determined over three votes, three congressional right. votes. So that so OK, so so and is that. Is that something that people realize? Is this part, is this the task then? Like to, to kind of make people understand like the, because I, I guess the reason I asked that question about the size of the electorate is because, you know, what that gives you is, is you've mentioned the figure 50 million. I mean, that is, that is power. You know, that is, that is obviously the ability to actually create huge change, isn't it? If you, if you can mobilize that 50 million. So is, is the task almost to educate people on, how much potential power that block actually has if the, if they combine to vote on these issues. Yeah, exactly. And so, uh, and I was just looking it up to give accurate numbers. So the, the, uh, the eligible electorate in the U S in 2016 was 250 million, but the turnout was actually only about half of that. So about 120 million. And then the election was determined by 50,000 votes, of you know sixty thousand of you know if you split that by you know by half that's like sixty million. When you're talking about fifty thousand votes out of sixty million you know, out of sixty million voters, it's it, it every vote matters, every vote counts. And I think our task is traditionally, I don't think that the adventure sports community has been really politically active. Um, it's not. It's you know, almost it's almost an anathema to the ethos of, you know, we do these things because we want to get away from politics. We we climb because we don't want to be burdened by the decision making or the hubris of politics. We go out for mountain bike rides, you know, to socialize with friends, not to talk politics, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's almost an anathema ethos to political involvement. But unfortunately, the there's just no no room left to stay on the sidelines on on some of these really important issues and our goal is we don't have to mobilize all 50 million people uh we don't have to mobilize even half of half a million people if we can mobilize a few thousand voters in the right geographies this election it can actually have a massive impact because the way i always talk about this is the, the environmental community, the climate community, I was in, uh, I, I've been working on climate issues for you know, at least 10 years. Um, and it's that community has done a really good job at building a base that shows up and thinks about climate and talks about climate. And that's their I mean, part of their identity. But that base has not been enough to actually move the needle in the last, you know, in the last 20 years. And that base, unfortunately, is not growing at the rate that uh, it would be necessary for that base alone to make a difference. But if you add to that base, the voices of the outdoor sports, the you know, voice of the outdoor sports community, and if you add the voice of, you know, even like the faith community, like some groups are working on, like if we bring non-traditional voices to that base and add that political power, it can be incredibly powerful and it can actually make a difference and swing the needle. So it's a, it's a multi-pronged task you've got ahead of you then. It's, it's building the space, it's identifying the right areas. Um, it's also overcoming this cultural apathy that you spoke to earlier you know this idea you use the word you you know you use you 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 put forward an idea that everyone can recognize you know the fact that like a lot in a lot of ways this culture is proudly apolitical and that and that apathy is is almost growing at the minute with the current climate so there's, there's a few conversations to be had around this topic is my point can i ask you a couple of questions about this constituency that we're talking about though so who do you see you know if we're talking about this 50 million strong block who who is that voter who is that potential voter i'm, I'm assuming this is obviously non-partisan this is a cross-party constituency we're talking about 
Yeah, so it's the, I think there's two main groups within that block, right? And it's the, we, we refer to as the, the ardents and the avids. And the ardents are those of us who make life decisions based on our ability to practice our sport uh, and on the non joining those communities. So it's the people that uh, choose the job that they work in because it'll, you know, give them pro deal discounts and access to the outdoors or because it maintains them within the community. It's the people that we see at ISPO and the people that we see at outdoor retailer and the athletes and the people who basically whose identity is directly tied to the ability to practice a sport and live this lifestyle. Um, you know, those then there's the then there's then those are what we call the avids and then you have the uh, sorry what we call the ardents and then we have the people that we refer to as the avids and that's the family that maybe books a winter vacation for uh two weeks out of the year and that's their and to go skiing and that's their that's that's their thing like that's what brings their family together or who practice multiple sports but are not necessarily uh, ultimately passionate about any of them or you know you're, the weekend you know the, the weekend hikers or the or the trail runners so you know those are the two the two groups that we kind of see as the two concentric circles one you know one embedded within the other and amongst the ardents we see a higher percentage of people who recognize the impact that climate change is having directly both on their lifestyle and on the places uh on the places they you know that they love to recreate so Ardents, because we spend so much time outside, we're the first people to notice when we have shorter winter season, less snowpack, uh, higher average uh, temperatures during the summer, you know, wildfires. Right now, we're in the middle of a massive wildfires in Colorado, and how they affect our how they affect our ability to get outside and climb, or our ability to get outside and mountain bike. So, with this, let's just say cross party block, you know. The, the the general political debate is so polarized right now. It's so partisan, you know. And climate is 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 a very politicized issue, particularly in the states. You know, but it's almost like an ideological divide, isn't it? Upon party lines, in terms of like the acceptance and the I'm going to use the word denial just because to make the point. Um, so presumably, the conundrum you have as an organization in trying to empower this this constituency is to depoliticize this whole conversation. Um, how easy is that to do, to to transcend this, this you know, set conversation that tends to happen whenever you have a political conversation in the current climate? Thanks for the question. That's actually, yeah, I'm, I'm going to actually challenge the, the underlying assumption of the question because it is a common misconception. Uh, and the, the idea is that, oh, there's this political group that believes that climate change is real, that believes that climate change is caused by humans, and that believes that you know we should be doing something about it in a very short term. And then there's this other political group that disagrees with all of those beliefs and that thinks that it's natural, that it's not happening, et cetera. The reality is that 64%, at least within the outdoors, uh, outdoor population, 64% uh, of people, regardless of political affiliation, actually believe that climate change is real that it's caused by humans and that it's going to have an impact either in our lifetime or in our or in our children's lifetimes so what i see as a challenge is and then there's obviously the group of people you know in the general population and in the outdoor sports population who don't think it's a problem who think it's a hoax etc etc cetera, et cetera. we're not as concerned in changing the point of view of people who have that belief and that worldview uh, that's a very big lift. It's not as you know. If you've ever gotten into a conversation with a climate, you know, with a strong climate denier, which Jeremy loves to do, and it's great and it's fantastic because I was going to say we've all seen Jeremy's Instagram comment section. So <laughs> exactly, uh, and it's great because it it just you know what he's doing, and especially with the project that he'll be launching, uh, Purple Mountains. What he's doing is he's finding the common ground, which I the most important. Uh, ethos that we can follow in this conversation is what's our common ground and let's build from our common ground but in terms of convincing people and the the, the strategic value of convincing people politically um, that's I think that becomes a second tier priority than getting people who already agree with this to make it a higher priority in their decision making process uh, and so it's 
we may disagree on you know we may disagree on gun control we may disagree on all of these other you know political issues we may on financial policy we may disagree on immigration policy there's a lot of things that we can disagree on that have the divide that drive deeper wedges between the party affiliations than climate does climate is some, actually something that we could come together on because most people actually agree and that's the that's this misconception that the, that there's political disagreement most people across both parties actually agree there's conversations to be had about what to be done about it. Uh, and those are valid conversations from multiple points of view. But if we can actually make it a priority that, hey, we agree that it's happening and we agree that it's a priority that we should make it happen, that's the, I think that's the lift um, from an ideological perspective. And then in terms of the work that POW is doing, it's even people who agree, even people who want to get something done about it, even some people who understand the policies, unfortunately, a lot of people in the outdoor sports community don't act, don't vote, um, and so for us, the bigger lift is making sure that people that we know agree with us, for whom this is a priority in their lives, are actually taking the action and trusting that their vote matters and getting out to the polls. It's really, really interesting that, and it's really smart and strategic, isn't it? Because it's subtle, you know. It's almost like rising above the actual as you called it, you know, false assumption at the heart of the question I asked, but, you know, just to say like, well, we actually don't even need to engage in that conversation. Like what we need to do is, is identify these areas where we can make a difference and focus our efforts on that, that aspect of the conversation. So it's very, and, and as you mentioned earlier, like it's quite, it's almost like you're talking about fine, pretty fine margins that you're aiming for. So is on that point of these swing states they're also am i right in thinking they're also known as purple states so have you got it down to that in terms of your plan your actual action you know act, action that we're going to talk about is it as calculated to to different areas to different states to different almost like issues in those states that you can speak to to kind of mobilize this support that you're looking for yeah so uh, that's exactly what we've done so uh the protect our winters action fund which is I want to make the distinction. We have Protect Our Winters POW, uh, and that is the educational and civic engagement organization that most people are familiar with. A lot of the work that we do in terms of specific targeting and battleground states legally is distinguished under the Protect Our Winters POW AF, uh, which is Protect Our Winters Action Fund, which is a different organization legally uh, with you know, different governance. And when we talk about the hyper-targeting that we're doing, it's the work that POW AF is doing. Um, my legal counsel just likes for, for me to make sure that that is very clear when we talk about issues. Totally clear. Yeah. Uh, but so having said that, what POW AF did is we actually looked at, okay, what are these, what are these purple states in 2020 and the, that have adventure sport mountain sport communities within them and we landed at new hampshire north carolina michigan nevada colorado and maine and then we looked at within those within those states then which districts within those states have actually swung by less than 10 percent of the electoral margin in the last three elections so the 2018 midterm election, the 2016 presidential election, and the, the last state election. And then once we had that, we thought, okay, within those, where are where are there population centers that are in you know, in the 300,000 to 800,000 size? Where are the markets in 300 to 800,000 people size? Because that's where we feel we can actually cut through the noise uh, a lot easier than we target cities of you know five ten million people and then within there we said okay then let's look at climbing gyms ski resorts universities and colleges um and other areas where you know those you know the outdoor sports community congregates and let's build relationships with those uh with those you know institutions or uh or businesses and let's bring our athletes and our influencers to those places and try to reach those audiences so we're pretty hyper focused and, and hyper targeted in how we're trying to get our message out, and we it's a similar approach uh, through our social media and our and our communication strategy. So you're trying to lead people to make, as you see it, like the right decision for climate when it comes to that that the vote. Is that is it? 
are you, are you are you basically trying to highlight the issues they might be concerned of and also th- how they literally should be putting a, putting a mark in the ballot box? Is that what it comes down to? So, yeah, so POW is trying to lead people to vote. Like, ultimately, regardless of which party, you know, you're affiliated with or who you're going to vote for, uh, POW, we just, you know, believe that the democracy depends on participation. And so we're trying to get people to make a plan to vote. We launched yesterday, we launched our Make a Plan to Vote tool, uh, which listeners can access through makeadamplan.org. Um and that is, you know, to facilitate the voting process, we have a challenge in the U.S. where, you know, this year and this election, where people should not have to choose between their ability to stay health, say, safe and healthy uh, and exercising their right to vote. And so voting by mail is, uh, is a big issue right now here. Uh, we should all be able to vote by mail, particularly in states that already allow it. We should be supporting the post office. We should be you know, funding the post office to make sure that, you know, all ballots are, all mail in ballots are delivered on time, received on time and counted. Um, and we should be exercising, uh, exercising that, that privilege. For especially those that are that are weary of going out to the actual polls, but then also making sure that we're getting out. If you can't vote by mail, if you don't vote by mail, that you're getting out to the polls November third. So that's bipartisan completely. Like that yeah. should be something that we all agree on, regardless of what political party you are. Democracy requires participation, and that we should encourage participation by whatever means possible. Uh, the Pow Action Fund, you know, what we're trying to do is highlight the voting records of, like the, of officials that are up for election uh, based on their, their approach towards climate change and addressing clean energy. So, you know, have they supported renewable energy? Have they supported, uh, do they support the extraction of fossil fuels from public lands? Are they, you know, do they have a voting record on, you know, on EPA? Uh, have they supported you know, the, the massive rollback of environmental regulations that's happened under this administration or not? And we'll be publishing a voter guidebook in mid, mid and late September that actually outlines those voting records for every uh, for, for every uh, candidate that we're work, uh, that that is in the states that we're that we're working in. I'm really interested in this idea that um, of the of the local issue as well. I know, and, and the national issue really, because you know, such a broad front, isn't it? The, the the topic of climate, in terms of the issues that are contained within that phrase or that word. Do you find that in different parts of the country, there are certain preoccupations, or that, or there are different concerns, or do you find it tends to be similar across the debate? No, different parts of the country have different preoccupations, and I think that has to do as well with how how. While climate change is this global problem, how its impacts are very localized. Uh, so, for example, here in Colorado, one of the issues of really high concern is drought uh, and our drought and fires, because that, as we have rising temperatures, that becomes that those become fires become more frequent. We know that fires are now 70% more frequent in the US than they were in the 1970s and that they last longer, they're more intense and they occupy more and they they occupy or or they burn more areas. Um, But then as you move into areas in the Midwest, they might be more concerned with flooding uh, or even in North Carolina, you know, flooding is a a big issue in, in North Carolina. So what water, usually water access, drought, uh, and then obviously for the industry, it's snow melt and the duration of the duration of winter. We had you know, an awful winter, 2017, 2018. Um, and, and so for states that have really strong outdoor industry, snow, um, snow related outdoor industry economies, that's, that's a big issue as well. And do you, do you try and, I mean, presumably you must have to choose where to focus as an organization when it comes to these issues to back up the wider message. How do you make those decisions? So we focus, or we've been focused for the last few years on four, four pillars of our policy agenda. One is a transition to a clean energy economy. And so that particularly solar. Uh, the other is stopping fossil fuel extraction from our public lands. The third is carbon pricing and supporting a, a, a price on carbon, which all, most economies agree would be the most effective way to internalize the, the, the cost of uh, 
greenhouse gas emissions. And the fourth is electric vehicles. We see huge potential in reducing emissions from electric vehicles. And the markets are actually starting to wake up to electric vehicles the way that they did to solar a while back. So those are the filters through which we approach most of our policy work, regardless of what state we're, what state we're in. Okay, so it's like that's the, the fourfold long-term strategic overview, if you like, of the organization. So the, the kind of activity you're talking about around the election is, is there to kind of augment those wider goals, essentially. Yeah, that it has been, and we'll probably be actually revisiting those in revisiting that in 2020, or sorry, in 2021. So, for multiple reasons. So, you know, for example, the solar industry is now doing really well. I mean, despite COVID having been a huge hit, uh, we expect that the solar industry will rebound and actually uh, continue to push ahead, just because the price of solar has dropped so dramatically. The price of solar has dropped 90 percent, 95 percent in the last decade. Uh, and it's a really strong industry generating lots of jobs. Uh, and we see a lot of growth and particularly as, you know, with growing natural disasters in places like California, the idea of having decentralized grid is very appealing. So we, you know, solar may be doing well enough. Um, but we see the need, the environmental justice is, is a topic and the intersectionality of, you know, climate and environment work with social justice is an area that, uh, we would like to figure out how to add more value to. Uh, I mean, we, it's no secret that the outdoor sports community is predominantly massively white, uh, and there's historical reasons for it, and there are economic reasons for it. Uh, and yet that doesn't mean that as we think about how do we engage in climate advocacy as outdoor sports enthusiasts, that we don't also think about how do we add value to common goals with you know, communities of color, or indigenous communities that are trying to protect their homelands or are trying to avoid uh, massive pollution coming into, their community, coming into their communities or staying in their communities that drive up things like asthma rates and you know, cardiovascular disease, et cetera, et cetera. So we see that, that that's, a, that's a huge area that we would like to partner up with uh, organizations and figure out where we can add value there. Uh, and another area that we've started working on this year that will, regardless of the outcome of the election, will very likely be a high area of focus for us is finance. Um, and where are it's, you know, where are the institutions that we support with our with our dollars and where our industry supports with our dollars? What are they doing with that money? Um, there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of studies coming out that expose how much investment different financial institutions have in fossil fuel and particularly um, you know what's particularly worrisome is new fossil fuel development. I mean, so it's a change in. It's a change in strategy as the situation changes by the sounds of it. So this is a post, you see that as a post-election refocus almost for the organization. So the point you make on the intersectionality term, which is obviously um, something that's been very much in the conversation this summer, um, what what practical steps do you think an organization like Protect Our Winners can make as part of that conversation? I know you said it's something you're going to be looking at in depth next year, but do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's been we've been having a lot of in-depth conversations uh, across you know across multiple levels of the organization. Uh, you know, our as a top priority for our board, as well as within our staff and team, but also within our alliance team. And I think you know th there's some immediate steps and things that we're doing already, and it's looking at how you know how can we increase representation in our public in our public facing uh, messaging, and so. There's, you know, we have amazing athletes like Peyton and Faith, uh, Faith Briggs, and then uh, there's a lot of athletes of color in, you know, in the outdoor sports community that usually don't get the the level of exposure that uh, that other athletes do. So we've started working with them more closely uh, to provide that exposure in our public-facing platforms, but then also bringing them to the forefront of the conversation. So. You know, we're about to launch a big initiative at here at the end of the month, and we had a creative concept, for example, uh, and we wanted we actually brought together a group of uh, our BIPOC representatives to have a conversation around the creative concept and getting input from them on their voice on what was you know what felt relevant to them culturally, what felt relevant uh, to them, or what might have been racially problematic for them, et cetera, and making sure that that input was added at the front of the at the front of the initiative. 
so those are you know, immediate steps uh, in the areas of mostly inclusion and representation that we're that we're taking already. Uh, we've also reached out for, to you know we have a list of 25 or 30 organizations that represent communities of color in the outdoor space that we've reached out to and offered to make our tool our make a plan to vote tool and the the cost associated with mail in ballot applications um, free. To, for their for their audiences and their community, so a mail-in ballot application form in, actually costs about a dollar fifty. Uh, by the time that you fill it out and like actually get it sent to you, we're offering to cover that cost because we see voter suppression as just a, a very obvious and blatant expression of uh, you know of racism that's been institutionalized. Uh, by targeting you know, minority communities across across the country, and you know, voting, we believe is that, again going back to our you know our, our core tactic is vote. We believe voting is the most important thing that we can do uh, in empowering voters. So that's the short term, and then in the long term, it really is looking at how do we embed this work into our strategy and working on issues of environmental justice and partnering up with organizations like in. Indigenous Environmental Network, perhaps, or uh, you know, Green Latinos or the Hip Hop Caucus, who have very similar alignment in terms of climate goals, but who operate in a different space and where alliances could be value add for uh, for both in both directions with a common goal. Do you feel positive about the progress that's being made in that in that area at the moment, personally? Uh, it's hard to feel positive in that area because the bar is so fucking low. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I mean, that's why I asked the question, really, because it's it, it, it it's you know. Sorry to interrupt you, but just to contextualize where I'm coming yeah. from with this, you know, like it's almost. I, I I've personally found it quite depressing, like some some aspects of that conversation this this summer, because it's almost like led me to actually understand like how much needs to be done because because you know when you look at you know you mentioned earlier like well this the outdoors per se is is you know considered to be a white space um but there's a lot of people who don't really see it like that who who feel like it's a very open space and who feel they don't really perceive there to be any problem and in and in that way you know it's almost like a manifestation of the wider privilege conversation that's going on and i found it quite eye-opening how much work there seems to be to do on that to actually close that understanding gap and to and for people to actually see yeah there is there is a huge amount of work to do and and it's not just a question of well on a lot of levels you know on a on a fundamental level like making these places more diverse making this conversation more open i it, it seemed like i'm sure you get where i'm coming from so is is that is is that something you you would agree with or or did did, did you you know you said the bar is so low, so I'm guessing you you also see it in perhaps similar term. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's a really nuanced and com and complex conversation that doesn't have any easy, simple answers. And um, I was talking to Nate Pierce, who is a you know who is a climber and is also a black activist with the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, we had we actually had an IG uh, IG live conversation just about a week ago on this on the topic, and I think. Overall, and this is my perspective, and obviously, you know, I'm 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 a Latino immigrant to the U.S., and there's a whole different history uh, than that of the Black community in, in the U.S., and that's something that's become very evident to me as we've been having more of these conversations. Um, but I think that overall, the, the outdoor sports community is pretty welcoming uh, to you know to people of different races and colors. That's one of you know, race, ethnicity, color, or you know, sexual orientation. That's something that I've always found that ethos of, uh, that ethos to be in incredibly um, refreshing. And I've always uh, really uh, uh, related and it's resonated with me. I feel like, you know, if you are, it's more important whether you are, you know, whether you show up on time to the trail <laughs> and whether you are, or whether you know how to build an anchor and whether you are a reliable belayer and whether you, you know, bring your avalanche gear, uh, you know, on a backcountry trip, like those are things that are so core to our, you know, whether you're a reliable partner, whether you're a reliable person in the outdoors are, are so core to our ethos that I do think that they supersede 
the you know, I don't want to say they supersede bias because there's always bias, but that they that they supersede other you know other perspectives. However, I think that the challenges is where we don't realize because we have been insulated is access, and it's how do we even you know we are privileged because we are already at the trailhead. We are privileged because we can. We we already have the gear. We're privileged because we are already we are already in this ecosystem, in this sphere, where these values come to play. And the work I think that a lot of the work that need that still needs to occur is understanding why is it that there isn't more divert like that we don't have more people or a, a wider representation, wider diversity at the trailhead on the ski chair you know, at the climbing crag, et cetera. Like, it's not, oh, once you're here, you know, we're all the same. How do you even get here? You summed it up really well. You know, like, as you say, it isn't even the question of, it's not about what happens when you're there. It's about how you get people there. I mean, that's that's a good summary, right? And and I think that's the, that's the subtlety of it, isn't it? Because I think that part of it, that, that, like being able to get there is such second nature to the people that are part of the community. They don't even really see it. They're like, oh, no, this is the same for everybody. Everyone can go there if they want. And it's like, well, that's actually the, what this conversation is about, isn't it? Like making sure that everybody has the opportunity to get there. So I think, yeah, I thought you you certainly put it more eloquently than I did. But that was the question I was getting at for sure. Yeah. Well, and there's two other components that I think are important that I've only really started to realize you know, as I've tried to learn more. Uh, in the last you know couple of months, two, three, three months. But the other piece is the, the representation is important not only uh, for diversity within the industry, but it's important as uh, for inspiration for the next generation. And it's do you know can a person of color see themselves reflected in the heroes that the industry puts forward as models? So you know. It's fantastic, and it doesn't take anything away from the Conrad Anchors and the Tommy Caldwells and the Jeremy Jones and the Chris Davenports and the Gretchen Blylers and the Hillary Nelsons and et cetera, and the the Caroline Glikes, et cetera. Uh, but it's you know we need more you know we need more people like you know, you know Jimmy like Jimmy Chin, and we need more people like Faith Briggs, and we need more people who other com- you know communities can see themselves reflected in and be inspired by Chloe Kim, you know, and be inspired by in order to say, oh yes, that is a pursuit that uh, I can that I feel the, resonates with me, uh, because that is also I think another way you know lowering the barrier to access but also increasing the level of inspiration of people who are models that are relatable to the communities. And it only, it will only enrich the outdoor sports community. It can only enrich the community and, you know, back to, you know, to the work that we're doing is if we all start sharing these values and we all start sharing the love for the places that, that we want to protect, then that also helps us advocate for those places and brings it full circle back to, you know, Hey, let's make this our priority as a, as a community and let's say make this also a voting priority. Well, I think that's really important to remember, isn't it? You know, that micro conversation leads to the, the macro conversation about the whole thing. The more you give people a personal connection to this environment and this, this community, then the, the more they're going to buy into the wider conversation and why it's important. I mean, and then again, that's something that we, I say we, people like I'm a white person that's got a long history in the outdoors you know that take for granted again you know for me it's like oh well I obviously I understand what the issue is because it affects me personally and I I see it but you know that that's not the same for everybody is it so it's 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 all linked as you say so on a similar topic um what do you think the outdoor industry's biggest strength is when it comes to fighting the climate crisis uh size and economic power so we have again we we have you know, millions of people who are passionate about about our sports and i was on a i was actually on a webinar not not too long ago with sia and uh and OIA, and it was incredible to hear how in certain areas retail has actually gone up and benefited from covid uh, because people want to get outside get outdoors and people who are not traveling are figuring out how do I actually get outdoors in my own, in, in my own community, in my own, and in my own backyard. I think that that is like the resilient, the economic resiliency, even 
even though it's being hit incredibly hard and I know that it's going, you know, that we're going through a really tough time economically, I do believe that the industry as a whole is going to be incredibly resilient coming out of COVID um, because people will have gained an even deeper appreciation for, for the sports and, uh, and for, and for the activities and will want to maintain, ma- maintain them. Um, and, you know, it's overall, it's an almost, almost a trillion dollar economy in the U S like $850 billion uh, when you put it all together. And to that, you add the numbers of people who participate in it combined, like that is a massive, that, that is a massive political force. Uh, it, the question really becomes, can we actually galvanize that power around the issues, you know, the, the biggest issue of our times uh, so that we realize, well, you know, sometimes, yes, trade might be an important issue this year and next year. But if we have to either support a candidate who's good on trade, but is terrible on environment, public lands and climate, and we're going to actually let them know that our priority is that they look at the long term sustainability of our sports, not at the short term viability of a specific product line. And how about weakness then on you know the flip side of the same question? What, what... What's the what's the weakness that this industry has when it comes to tackling this crisis? I think we're getting better, and I've just in in my time at Pow in the last two years at Pow, I've seen huge progress already. Uh, but the it's we're traditionally we're not an advocacy culture, uh, right? You have the brands that you expect it from, like you know the Patagonias and the Burtons, uh, and now you know and then now increasingly the North Face but it's not in our dna like it's not in the dna of the industry to actually uh to to be advocates and so uh coordinating you know coordinating across brands like getting initiatives together uh and and actually bringing all of that power that i was talking about together in you know around with the concerted strategies and with the concerted priorities etc in order to be reflected externally as a single as a single block uh, I think is the is the greatest weakness. Like you have, there's just so many disparate initiatives, and so and you know, just lack of sometimes lack of coordination, but also sometimes lack of galvanizing around around the issue. Uh, yet it's been really amazing and encouraging to see in the last couple of years how much progress we've made, even uh, e- even there. What do you put that down to then? This lack of advocacy culture. Is there anything, you, uh, so, you know, uh, that's a pretty impossible question to, to ask, really. But it's an interesting insight. Do, do, do you just, uh, and you know, off the top of my head, do you feel it's because they're traditionally individualistic pursuits in a lot of ways? Um, you know, they, they, they kind of encourage that kind of individualistic, approach in some ways I mean, that's just like I said off the top of my head is that, is that something that you would put it down to can you pinpoint where that comes from because it because it suggests there is a huge cultural shift required to get there right which is obviously what, what you what you you know what you're getting at with the work that you're doing and, and and this makes sense as an answer because it really helps to explain the position of the organization as well yeah well it's uh i'm glad you asked that question we actually did uh we were very fortunate to receive a relatively large grant in 2019 to do market research uh and so we were uh, on this on these questions and we were uh we interviewed we did 3100 online interviews six focus groups across the country uh in you know some online uh, online discussion boards and then had a, had a consultant actually distill it all into market research and some of the conclusions. And one of the conclusions or takeaways that we got is that while the passion that people have for our sports work for us in terms of their willingness to engage and protect it, the nature of the sports themselves and the motivator for participating in those sports actually work against collective action. And it's exactly what you were referring to. And it's this idea, A, that the sports are pretty individualistic and it's about, you know, let's me get me and two or three of my friends outdoors and doing this thing. Let's avoid the crowds. Yeah. Let's avoid the crowds. And, and it's, you know, because we want to feel, it's about my health. It's about my ba- uh, work life balance. It's about my performance. Uh, so a very individualistic approach. And then there's also the, the getting away from it all. It's yeah. The, the 
most of us are waiting for you know, Friday afternoon to be able to just get away from the things that weigh us down and be disconnected. And so trying to merge these worlds of we want, yes, that's what we want to do. And those are our passions and our values and, and our motivators. And at the same time, we need to interact with the political system, with the, you know, with the financial system. We need to interact with these systems that we try to get away from, from this united position as a collective uh, is, a, is, is a bridge, right? So I think about it the way that, you know, why the way that the NRA was so effective in the 80s and 90s, right? And it's they were able to merge lifestyle and advocacy um, to where you know, being an NRA member was about not just owning a gun, but it was about a whole lifestyle that went along with it. And it was tied to a value system around, you know, the the constitutional uh, the constitution and it was tied to the sense of patriotism and it was tied and then obviously the outcome was you know, political engagement yeah you you didn't you don't you know you see you know NRA having barbecues and gene competitions and there's this whole ecosystem cultural ecosystem that the NRA capitalized on and brought together in order to become a political force. That's, I think, where you know the outdoor industry could be far more powerful if we agreed, hey, we have this cultural ecosystem where it's very diverse, it's very spread, but we're going to agree that these two, three things are our core priorities because they are directly tied to our values and they affect our lifestyle. Oh, it makes so much sense, like I say, with the positioning then of of the organization to to focus on those key issues and then yeah try and raise the community up around those issues because you know it's interesting isn't it because it if you look at something like surfing like there is a historical history of advocacy on a very local level you know that, that can certainly be an engaged community but yeah it's not it's not particularly you're never going to see it grow beyond that unless it's a, a huge banner issue for it to for people to unite around essentially you know, I'm thinking about, about something like Surfers Against Sewage in the UK, which has been very, very successful at uniting, cr- building, as you described it with the NRA, like creating a culture around that that advocacy that almost becomes part of the individual identity, um, which, yeah, like is, is a huge challenge, isn't it? And clearly with this um, campaign that you're, that you're embarking upon for the election, huge part of that to create that by the sounds of it. So you did you did mention COVID. Um, I mean, I'm not going to ask you what you did during lockdown, but I do have a question on that because obviously in a lot of ways, the response to COVID has been almost like a, a very quick fire dry run to a potential response to, to, to the, the issues you might face with, with the climate in the future, namely economic issues, um, issues of, of community and governmental responsibility. Um, has the response to that given how do you well let's even leave it even more open-ended are you positive or negative after you've seen the response to covid about what that might say about the future of climate activism both <laughs> there's i think what's been really amazing to see has been that despite the lack of coordinated leadership at at least in the u.s at a federal level uh there have been states where that have taken leadership roles and been able to organize and people have taken personal responsibility and been willing to make some sacrifices in order to do their best to contain you know to, to contain the crisis and you know and to think of others really um you know and the most vulnerable and the most vulnerable populations um, there's also, I think we're learning a lot about what we can do without the need for travel, like, you know, practice like telecommuting, uh, you know, virtual meetings, et cetera, mm-hmm. that are, you know, that there's no reason why we could not continue those into, into the future and really examine our, uh, examine our lifestyles and personal carbon, you know, personal carbon footprints. Um, and then what i find challenging in their response but that is again directly tied i think to the current leadership has been the lack of long-term thinking in terms of how do we rebuild the economy Um, and i think europe has done a much better job at building in green 
uh, it, the, the green energy, clean energy incentives, green uh, clean energy um, funding for a tra it, the transition package. Or, you know, they call it here. They call it a stimulus package. I'm not sure that it was a stimulus package more than a bailout package. We're not hmm. stimulating. We're still, you know, we're still in, in the throes of the recession. So it's 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 more of a stay afloat than a stimulus, and it's 3.5 trillion dollars, right? So never before have we globally had an opportunity. Maybe the closest that I would think of would be the Marshall Plan after World War II or you know, the reconstruction after World War II to pour this amount of money into the global economy. Yeah, exactly. Top down, like you say, federal governmental as well. So, yeah, that's the point, isn't it? And have the time, you know, because the economy is frozen, because things are so, so much slow, have the time to actually think through how do we spend this money in a way that is building a different, that is helping to build a more sustainable infrastructure and energy system for the next 20 to 30 years, rather than how do we keep pouring money down the drain or how do we keep more pouring money into fossil fuel companies to keep them afloat now? Yeah. When we've seen that the business that is that that is a business model with a setting horizon, uh, the, you know, coal was already in awful trouble before the, before COVID hit. Oil we saw took you know the, the biggest nosedive out of you know, pretty much any sector. Then uh, when COVID when COVID did hit, it's you know, it's uh, it, it, it vulnerable to geopolitical shifts. It's vulnerable. We've seen now to you know, unexpected shifts like COVID, et cetera. Whereas, you know, investing in local energy, local renewable energy sources just makes so much more sense. Um, and the lack of foresight right now in the spending, you know, in the spending from the current administration, at least here in the U.S., is, um, is, is not very encouraging. But if we're able to actually, over the next 18 months, as we, you know, ideally find a vaccine and start you know reopening in larger sectors of the economy and get into economic recovery we start thinking about okay where does actual stimulus get uh, get invested into I infrastructure energy uh, you know even uh, redistribution in terms of uh, community pro uh, community programs etc it's I think there's a lot of potential I think we have huge potential to actually create a major shift in a, in a dramatic way rather than doing it in a stepwise manner the way we've been expecting it would need to happen. So you've got a positive take ultimately because, yeah, you know, it's like a, a use the word like dry run. I mean, it was an opportunity, wasn't it? Essentially, like you say, you know, it was an opportunity to say like, well, here's, here's an issue that raises issues we're going to face clearly through climate. So what, so how can we do it? And yeah, you know, it comes down to leadership, doesn't it? And And as you say over here, it's been an interesting experience because for example in the uk you know we have a considered to be a pretty right-wing government right now who've done a lot of things you know displayed awful leadership throughout this whole thing um but then they have used this as an opportunity to advance a bit more of a greener and a clean energy agenda in a lot of ways you know they have um they have sort of taken the opportunity so that th there's been glimmers of leadership i guess we could say um but you but you generally it sounds like you you see it as a hopeful you know it, it's shown that there could be positive things happening when the time comes um okay great well i've got if we could finish up with a couple of questions about your story and background that that'd be great so you mentioned that your uh what like your backgrounds your family's from guatemala is that right were you also born in guatemala yeah, I was born and raised in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. And um, so how did you end up in the position you're in now? If you can give me the short version. <laughs> yeah, I think m my standard answer is usually I took a left turn at Cotopaxi <laughs> <laughs> and landed here. Uh, the short version, I mean, the, the middle version is uh, I was fortunate enough. I, I, uh, I had a scholarship to come to the U.S. for college. I went back to Guatemala for three, four years after that, then came back to the U.S. for graduate school. Um, and I studied geosystems analysis, and I was first exposed to you know, climate change there. But I thought, oh, this is something that you know, we'll need to worry about in 20 years. Uh, we still got some time. Right. As I, as I did a lot of international work, I, you know, I lived in Australia for a while. Uh, did several seasons in the Dominican Republic uh, and then spent five and a half years in Ecuador. 
uh, it just became very, very clear that the common denominator of negative environmental change was being driven, the long-term negative environmental change was being driven by uh, by climate forcing. So whether it was coral bleaching of the uh, you know, Great Barrier Reef in Australia, whether it was you know, consequent flooding and you know, more, uh, more damage from tropical storms in the Dominican Republic, or whether it was melting glaciers in, you know, in the Andes in Ecuador, there was this common thread. So that got me really concerned uh, with the issue of climate and I started looking into it a lot deeper. Uh, this was around around 2010, I ended up moving back to the U.S., and this is when in the U.S. there was the discussion around the carbon, uh, basically the, the cap-and-trade program, which ultimately failed. And it was, to me, it was, a, you know, from the outside, it was really surprising how could it be that with, you know, uh, you know uh, 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 with Obama in, in, in the presidency, with a Congress that was majority Democrat, which I you know believed in, you know, believed that we need to do something about climate change. How could it be that this thing still failed? And that actually got me far more interested in the policy and politics part of it. Uh, so I moved back to the U.S. in 2010, started working on climate education. Uh, did that work for about three years, and then. Uh, spent five years working uh, for former Vice President Al Gore's organization, Climate Reality Project, doing a lot of their, uh, basically setting up the trainings that he does uh, internationally. And then in the last two years after Paris, doing work in, in what does the international strategy for the organization look like uh, in a post-Paris world? What can countries do to actually focus on the implementation? But alongside, you know, my whole life, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I started when I, after college, I started a, a guide shop out of Antigua, Guatemala. I've been, I, you know, while I was in Ecuador, I did some guiding uh, on Cotopaxi. Uh, so I've always kind of straddled the two worlds between environmental work and, um, you know, an outdoor, rec an outdoor recreation. You know, I you know, came to the U.S. and picked up snowboarding. You know, Jeremy will tell you, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a mediocre snowboarder at best in his eyes. <laughs> So my, you know, my, my MO and my MO since I joined POW has been to try and rock climb with Jeremy Jones and try and ski with Conrad Anker. And then that way I can kind of hold my own. Ah, well, that's not a bad. It's not a bad position to take, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so, you know, so POW is just such a natural and uh, natural fit and it just, it, it occupies two of the most important areas of my life uh, at the same time. So I feel incredibly privileged uh, to be able to work for an organization that it shares the cultural ethos that I believe in personally and that I'm a part of personally and is dedicated to moving forward the, the policy and the, and the solutions that I have dedicated my professional life to. Yeah, I'm just going to say it sounds like the perfect mix, really, given your, your backgrounds and, and interests. So a question I often ask guests on type two, as I mentioned, got a very engaged audience who are, you know, really passionate about the issues we've been discussing. And usually I get a lot of questions like, you know, how can I get involved or how can I start on my own sort of journey as an activist? So, uh, you know, if somebody's listened to this and they're inspired by what we've talked about and they think, right, you know, I need to, I need to start doing something there. Like what advice would you give them? Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. That we get that question very often. I think you know it's a similar pathway than uh, than we than we do for any social movement. And it's the first get educated. So there's tons of resources on our website. You can go to protectourwinters.org, the resources tab. We have tons of readings, podcasts, uh, videos, books, etc. That uh, to get a good sense of what where we are in the issue, what does it mean, and then start taking action with us. So you can go to protectourwinters.org. Uh, initiatives, programs, and there we have volunteer programs. We always have campaigns that we're running uh, in terms of advocacy on specific issues. And then, you know, particularly over the next three months, the most important thing is going to make a damn plan.org. Make a plan to vote. Make sure that you're going to show up at the polls. And once you've made your own plan, uh, make sure that your friends are going to vote. So we have an app called the Team app that allows you to contact all of your friends and make sure that um, they're registered and making a plan to vote 
and sharing you know sharing materials on social media making sure that we we're, we're bringing this conversation to the fore to the forefront uh, and driving that cultural change that we've spoken to uh, that we've spoken to before and get involved locally i think you know patagonia has a lot of great programs uh, with their action works program that are that are very local uh, and there's organizations working on issues locally uh, every time. So there's no lack of ways to get involved. But I would say great ways. Just start, you know, start by protectourwinters.org, go to resources, get educated, and then figure out what the next step that you're willing to take is. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time. I really enjoyed that. That was great. Yeah, thank you as well. Uh, really great reconnecting with you at a time when we're not both completely worn out. <laughs> sounds like we need to do some uh, snowboarding next time so i look forward to that yeah sounds like a plan so there you go that was me in conversation with mario hope you enjoyed it if you want to find out more about protect our winters then head on over to protectourwinters.org. if you want to find out more about some of the schemes that protect our winters action fund are uh, spearheading you can go to make a damn and if you want to find out more about purple mountains the new film from Jeremy. That's purplemountainsfilm.org. Um, yeah, plenty of resources there and plenty of weighty things to get stuck into if you want to do some more reading or research off the back of that episode. Big thanks to Mario and his team at Protect Our Winters for the help in facilitating this one. And like I said earlier, to Mario for a really memorable and um, insightful conversation. Nice one. As you probably know by now, I release new episodes of Type 2 every month or so. They appear in my usual Looking Sideways channel, which you can subscribe to via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your usual podcast provider. If it's your first time checking out what I do, um, Type 2 is a way that people find out about Looking Sideways. Then make sure you get over to the website, which is www.wearelookingsideways.com, where you can find my entire back catalogue of well over 130 episodes now of interviews with some of the biggest names in action sports and other related endeavors there's show notes there's a blog you can sign up for the newsletter there's a lot on there basically so go and have a look www.wearelookingsideways.com all right thanks for listening and i'll see you next time nice one